So yeah, here we go, another experiment. Their total is gonna be 90,000 fish today. Okay. So, and there's 10 trucks, so there's 9,000 fish in, in each load. and how good they are and they don't even they don't even breed fish it's a wild it's a wild fishery and it's hugely successful
truck number two, their total is gonna be 90,000 fish today. Okay. So, and there's 10 trucks, so there's 9,000 fish in, in each load. It'll be 10 loads today. Did anybody say why so many at once, not knowing they will survive well, at all? Again, it's two different agencies. I, I asked the guy down there that's in charge of the coho program for the northern region. And I asked him directly, I said, Have, has anybody done any monitoring downriver yeah. to see if there's something for these fish to eat? Yeah. Well, you know, the bugs are, it's spring's coming, so they're going to have start having a lot of bugs fall in the river. And that's probably what they're going to have to eat because we know that that sediment release killed everything, including the indestructible crawdad, which I thought was an indestructible critter. Some of the waters I've seen it live in, but it killed every stinking one of them. Uh -huh. So um, I was asking if they had done any monitoring of the river down river uh, to see if there was food for them to eat. And basically his, basically his response was, that's not in my department. It's not in, it's not in Fish and Games, Fish and Wildlife's charter to do that. Uh, but you had all the tribes here, they're blessing it. I get it. There's, believe me, there's nothing more I'd like to see than to be able to walk outside our cabin and throw a rod, throw a line into this river and catch a coho salmon. Problem was that they didn't, you know, they, they took into account the tribes, what their wants and needs are and they didn't spend enough time on the people. Other people, the, the tribes are saying, our river, our river. Hey, well, it's our river too. It's not just your river. And they didn't take into account enough of these people that have lived on this river for a hundred years too. You know, farmers and ranchers and people that live along the river and rely on the river for their drinking water and their, and their irrigations. Um, they didn't take into enough account of those people. Okay? That's all they had to do meet everybody halfway can, and, and address everybody's concerns, not just one group's concern. That's called special interest and that ain't supposed to happen. But honestly, talking to the fish and game people down there, the fish and wildlife people, some very, very good people. They're, they're passionate about what they do and their thing is fish. You know, they're not into the politics of Dan removal. They're not into the politics of, of uh, what the tribes want the fish and wildlife people that are involved in this release program that run the hatcheries, all they want is to produce a genetically good solid fish uh, because nature's not doing it, so man's going to do it. I, I spoke at length to several of these guys about our experiences in Alaska. Those are all wild fish. There's no, there's no hatcheries in Alaska. And it's very well managed. They need to start looking at that. They, they, they set quotas on fish. They make sure there's an escapement up the river. So if that includes putting a moratorium on salmon, on the returning salmon on this river in, in next year, five years or whatever it is, then the, the, the tribes at the mouth of the river have got to be included in this moratorium. There has got to be quotas set on them. They just can't catch every goddamn fish that comes up that river. You know, they have to give the fish a chance. You know, and if they're, if they, uh, out of 900,000 fish or whatever that they release, if they see 9,000 come back, that's a huge increase on what they've seen in the past. Okay, but you can't let the tribes catch 6,000 of them at the mouth. That's not, that's not giving the fish a chance. So if you truly want to make this river a solid salmon river, they have to be included in, in the management of the return. And they agree. The fish and game people agree with that. Now that's a political issue, but if it's truly about returning this river to a decent and it's not about trout, it's all salmon, salmon and steelhead. If they want to make this river, give it a chance. Uh, then they have to they have to manage it to be successful. That includes the tribes.
talking, there's that much sludge in there. More than that. We're 50 miles downstream. Or 12 miles downstream. 48 miles about. It's nasty, just saying, yeah. So who's gonna clean this up, right? I mean, I mean, cubic yards of this stuff. I mean, we're 50 miles down river from the. Is there any? Is there any ecological benefit to this stuff? To the soils? I don't see it in. So the river bottoms themselves have got to be absolutely common. This is criminal. This was a, a Republican, or a, yeah, a Republican a governor had done this. You would have violent protests all along this river, but because this has been orchestrated by the uh, the environmentalists in there's no protest there's no protest it's all rainbows and unicorns well except for the people that live on the river except for the people that live here or the lake with dry wells, contaminated wells, uh, all this stuff on our property that, yeah, we don't know how this is gonna pan out. Well, it's a hundred years of accumulation behind the dams was released in a matter of days. Three days. <clears throat> it should have been, well, they know what they should have done and they didn't do it. And who you really have to blame it on? You can blame it on the money, you can blame it on KRC, you can blame it on RES, you can blame it on Berkshire Hathaway and Pacific Corp. You can blame on them all day long. But the real culprit in this is the governor and the legislator of the state of California. Because they had the power to stop it or mitigate it, and they didn't. So where's the money going? Who's getting the money for this?